FAR Part 91 covers general operating and flight rules. A good way of remembering what Part 91 covers is that Part 61 is all about your certificate and Part 91 is how to keep it. Part 91 will have all the rules and regulations that you can think of to stay safe and legal in the air. We're going to cover the following regulations. This is not a complete list of regulations you need to know about, but they are the most important ones to take note of. You'll need to read through Part 61 and 91 all on your own in addition to watching this video. Highlight and take note of the items that pertain to you. As the pilot in command, or PIC, you're directly responsible for the operation of the aircraft you're flying. That also means that you're the final authority. This applies to all operations. An airline captain has the final authority of their aircraft, and if a passenger is causing a disturbance, the captain has the final say on the matter. If there is an emergency, then it's the PIC who has the final authority on how they would like to solve the issue. The PIC may legally deviate from any rule or regulation to deal with an emergency, although they may be asked to submit a written report to the FAA after this deviation. You may not fly an aircraft if you have had alcohol within 8 hours of the flight, are under the influence of alcohol, having an alcohol concentration of 0.04 or greater in a blood test or breath test. Lastly, you cannot be on any drug that alters your faculties in any way contrary to safety. Remember the rule, 8 hours bottle to throttle. As a pilot in command, you must make yourself familiar with all available information regarding the flight you're about to take. This is a lot of pressure, but with a steady routine, it's very doable. A couple of items to keep an eye on include a pre-flight of the aircraft. Make sure it's to standard and airworthy. Make sure the aircraft isn't due for any maintenance by going through the maintenance logs. Do a proper weather briefing. Familiarize yourself completely with your departure, your route, and destination. Never go anywhere you're totally unfamiliar with. It's important to know who has the right of way in the air. As a helicopter pilot, you rarely have the right of way due to the maneuverability of the helicopter. An aircraft in distress always has the right of way. That means all other aircraft in the area have to give way to the aircraft in distress. If two aircraft are converging, then there's a tier list you must follow to give the appropriate aircraft the right of way. The general rule is that the less the maneuverable the aircraft, the higher on the right of way tier list that aircraft most likely is. If approaching another aircraft head on, both aircraft must turn to their right immediately. The aircraft on final has the right of way. Final is the portion of flight where the aircraft is lined up with the runway and getting ready to land. If two aircraft are landing at the same time, the aircraft at the lowest altitude has the right of way. This is not to be abused, but it does happen from time to time at uncontrolled airports. If it does happen, don't start a fight on the radio. Stay professional and either let it go or talk to the person calmly on the ground after the flight. Except when necessary for takeoff and landing, you cannot fly an aircraft at a low altitude that wouldn't allow for a safe landing in case of an engine failure. This is up to the pilot's discretion. Never fly low and slow. For most of aviation, you have to stay at least 1000 feet above the highest obstacle when flying over a congested area. A congested area can generally be considered any place where people are living. This doesn't apply to helicopters though. As a helicopter pilot, you are free to fly at whatever altitude you deem safe as the PIC. You just have to comply with any direction the ATC gives you. That means if you're flying within the class Delta airspace at 200 feet and they're telling you to climb, then you have to initiate a climb. In case you're wanting to land at an airport and happen to lose your communications, every ATC facility will have light signals to communicate with you. These are also referred to as light guns, as the controller will have to manually aim them directly at you. If you're in the air and see a steady green signal, you're clear to land. It really helps to have a chart like this one with you in flight. Running out of fuel in flight only has one person responsible, the pilot in command. It's an unacceptable emergency to have happen, as it's easily avoidable with proper planning. Many of the regulations in the FAR AM exist due to an event having happened. 91151 states that you must land at your destination with enough fuel left to fly an additional 20 minutes at cruise speed, taking winds and forecast weather into consideration. Flying with low fuel is sure to get your heart rate going. Don't mess around with minimal fuel. Conduct proper pre-flight planning and make sure you have adequate reserves to complete the flight safely. To fly in different classes of airspace, you'll need to be able to adhere to specific requirements such as a minimum visibility and cloud clearance. For example, to enter a class Delta airspace, you must have at least 3 statute miles visibility and be able to maintain 500 feet below the clouds, 
2,000 feet horizontally of the clouds, and 1,000 feet above them. A statute mile is the same as a normal mile when driving. A nautical mile takes into consideration the curvature of the Earth and is used at sea. A nautical mile is slightly longer than a statute mile for that reason. The airspace triangle will help you effectively memorize the basic VFR weather minimums. Draw it up until you're able to do so from memory. It'll help you greatly as this is the information you need to have readily available at all times as a pilot. This will come up on any test. One thing about the basic VFR weather minimums that's different between helicopters and airplanes is that helicopters are able to fly with just half a mile visibility and remain clear of clouds in Gulf airspace in less than 1,200 feet above ground level. During nighttime, the visibility requirement is up to one mile. This leaves helicopters at a very flexible and possibly dangerous spot. Know your personal limitations and know what's safe to fly in. Just because it's legal doesn't mean it's safe or smart. Should the current weather or visibility be below visual meteorological conditions, ATC may still allow flights under VFR flight rules under certain circumstances. Special VFR operations may only be conducted when you have an ATC clearance, remain clear of clouds, are the only aircraft at the airport operating under SVFR, and you stay within the boundaries of the airspace. A helicopter can operate with zero visibility with an SVFR clearance, as long as it remains clear of clouds. SVFR can be requested in all classes of airspace except for Alpha. SVFR is available at day and night. Please note that airplanes have very different requirements to operate under SVFR. An aircraft needs a minimum amount of instruments and equipment to be airworthy. Part 91205 explains in detail what your aircraft needs. There are two lists to become familiar with, equipment needed for VFR flight during the day and equipment needed for VFR flight during the night. I'm going to cover the instruments required for a piston engine helicopter such as the Robinson R-22. What you're going to need is an airspeed indicator, an altimeter, a compass, a tachometer, an oil pressure gauge, an oil temperature gauge, a manifold pressure gauge, a fuel gauge, and safety belts. Memorize this list by using the acronym CAMASFOOT. For nighttime, you're going to need the daytime instruments plus spare fuses, a landing light, anti-collision lights, position lights, and a source of power. Memorize this list by using the acronym FLAPS.